about how God uses someone who makes themselves available. So Philip is someone who the Holy Spirit selected early on in the church to minister to the widows and the orphans. And from there, God uses him to lead an entire city to Christ. So by Acts chapter 8, verse 25, where we're going to pick up, he already has a great Christian resume built. He, he could have, at this point, kind of made excuses and said, you know, I've kind of done my God thing, and, and I'm good. Especially when the instructions he gets are so odd. I mean, if you were to say a modern-day equivalent, it would be uh, to, an angel showing up to you and saying, I need you to go walk Mulford Road. Why? Right? It's, it's very unusual. And, uh, and so it would have been easy for him to make excuses. I'm really busy. I'm serving you, God. And, and while being available and obedient is a great lesson, when you start to look at this account from the perspective of the Ethiopian eunuch, as is often the case with Scripture, you get a completely different sermon. Because it's that rich. So if you're someone that has ever felt like, I don't know if I really fit with religious people, or if you have a heart for those who find themselves on the outside looking in, then this is a message for you. If you have your Bible, Acts chapter 8, verse 25 is where we pick up. And here we see Philip and his companions, they're, his companions, they're heading home after a visit into the Samaria, region of Samaria. So Acts chapter 8, verse 25. So when they had solemnly testified and spoken the word of the Lord, they started back to Jerusalem and were preaching the gospel to many villages of the Samarians, Samaritans. So Philip and his companions who were with him were already doing controversial ministry in a controversial area. As Jewish Christians preaching Jesus to Samaritans. Um, Probably not everybody was on board with that. Samaritans are not typically embraced by the Jews. Now, the land that they were on had been a part of the Israel land, but they were immigrants who had been placed there by other rulers who had conquered Israel. And for over seven centuries, they had lived there and slowly kind of blended somewhat with the Jews. They had adopted the Mosaic Law, the first five books, the Torah. They had said, that's ours, we're in on that. But they were not invited into temple worship, so they built their own temple. And there was a, a lot of animosity between these two groups. You may recall the Samaritan woman at the well, and Jesus is trying to minister to her, and she wants to argue over which temple is the right one to worship at. Right? Are you in my camp or not? We have a lot of, we have a lot of divides in our society right now, right? And, and we want to know, are you with me or against me? Right? And, and that's exactly what this woman was doing with Jesus. Are you with me or are you against me? There's a lot of bad blood. And when you hear the story of the good Samaritan, why does it blow their minds? Because like they hate each other. So how can a Samaritan be good? It doesn't even make sense. So Philip is already embracing a people who would have normally been taboo, and, and now the limits of that get pushed even farther. Okay? Verse 26, an angel of the Lord spoke to Philip, saying, Get up and go south to the road that descends from Jerusalem to Gaza. Or to Gaza. This is a desert road. So he got up and he went. And there was an Ethiopian eunuch, a court official of Candace, queen of the Ethiopians, who was in charge of all her treasure. And he had come to Jerusalem to worship, and he was returning and sitting in his chariot, and he was reading the prophet Isaiah. Now, let me give you a little bit of background on eunuchs. Some of this you might know, but some of it I, I can almost guarantee you won't. Because we don't spend a lot of time focusing on eunuchs in Scripture. But the name eunuch literally means keeper of the bed. Okay? So they were the servants in a palace or a home that was wealthy that would oversee, classically, the harem. 
Okay? They could also be the servant of the lady of the house, but to make sure nothing inappropriate happened, they had their man parts either partially or totally removed. Okay? You may also recall from Jewish history, what was the sign of being a part of God's covenant with the Jewish people? Circumcision. This presents a problem for a eunuch. It's already gone. Following me? So, because of their bodily mutilation, in the Jewish community, they were universally excluded from participation in temple worship. And this goes all the way back to Deuteronomy 23.1. Okay? Now, you've got to think, this, we're talking about New Testament going all the way back to one of the first five books of the Bible. Deuteronomy 23.1 says, No one who is emasculated or has his male organ cut off shall enter the assembly of the Lord. You guys had no idea this is what we are going to be talking about today, did you? <laughs> so that raised a question for me as I'm studying this. I go, it, with all the hustle and bustle of people going in and out of the temple, how does someone enforce this rule? And that made me realize that this was probably far more evident in other physical ways than maybe we first realized. Without normal testosterone production, these men, while dressed like men, probably had a pretty gender-neutral appearance, causing them to stand out. They, they were the kind of people who got curious looks when they walked down the street, right? What's wrong with them? They look different. Does that make sense? So this particular eunuch was a servant of the queen of Ethiopia. So he's not only a eunuch, he's not Jewish. Now there were Jewish eunuchs, but this is not one. So it's interesting to note that, that all the queens of Ethiopia were named Candace. So it's kind of like how all the kings of, of Egypt were pharaohs. Okay? Queens of Egypt were Candaces. So the queen was the royal figure that interacted with the people because the king in Ethiopia was considered a god and above the, the interactions with mere mortals. Okay? So the queen really kind of ran the show. The king was worshipped. And, and in addition to being a eunuch for the queen, this particular eunuch was also her treasurer. So he had really established a very elevated position. He had access to resources. He had journeyed to Jerusalem, seemingly on his own, not with the queen, seeking to worship God, but he couldn't get into the temple, right? Yet because of his wealth and his position, he had managed to procure a copy of Isaiah so that he could learn more about the God he was seeking to worship. A remarkable story. So you have the Ethiopian is seeking God and there is no clear path for him. He's out on the outside. He doesn't fit. He's not welcome. He's been relegated to the margins by the religious people of his day. Sound familiar to... I mean, there's people like that out there, right? That we just... Mm. But, God always makes a way for those who seek Him. So, here He is, riding across the countryside, on His way home, it's actually a desert, a desert road. He's trying to figure out Scripture and God arranges this divine appointment. Verse 29, Then the Spirit said to Philip, Go up and join his chariot. And Philip ran up and heard him reading Isaiah the prophet. And he said, Do you understand what you're reading? And he said, Well, how could I unless someone guides me? And he invited Philip to come up and sit with him. 
So the Holy Spirit has totally arranged this meeting. The Ethiopian would not have known to ask Philip if Philip had not raised the question. Philip wouldn't have even been there to raise the question if the Holy Spirit hadn't prompted him. And in Acts 8.32, as we keep reading, it goes into the passage that he was reading. Now the passage of Scripture which was read was this. Quote from Isaiah 53. He was led as a sheep to be slaughtered, and as a lamb before its shearer is silent, so he does not open his mouth. In humiliation, his judgment was taken away. Who will relate his generation? For his life is removed from the earth. So this eunuch answered Philip and said, Please tell me, who does the prophet say this about? Of himself? Or someone else. That, I mean, what a setup. Right? I mean, this passage is quoting Isaiah 53. You could probably recognize as churchgoers, this is describing Jesus. I mean, we just celebrated Easter and read about the crucifixion. We know how Christ went to the cross as the final sacrificial lamb who takes away the sin of the world. And so, in verse 35, it says, And Philip opened his mouth, and beginning from Scripture, he preached Jesus to him. It's like, yeah, I can tell, it's not the prophet. It's, this is Jesus. I'll show you. So Philip got to show this Ethiopian that God loved him. That Christ came to die for his sin. That after three days in the tomb, Christ conquered death so that he could live forever with him after being marginalized and even just outright rejected for maybe the first time ever the Ethiopian eunuch heard about God's love in Christ he heard it it sunk in and the measurement of that love was the demonstration of that love was God giving the life of his only begotten son as a payment for our sin, so that whoever believes in Him would not perish but have everlasting life. It's, it is such good news. The invitation of redemption and a place of belonging to this outsider, overwhelming. This, this is the part that just blows me away. So he's reading from Isaiah 53. He's clearly got a copy of Isaiah, right? If you have your Bible, I want to encourage you to jump to Isaiah 56, just three chapters ahead of where this Ethiopian is reading about Christ. Just three chapters later in Isaiah 56, you're going to find that God has always intended for everyone seeking him in faith to have a place in his family, even outsiders like an Ethiopian eunuch. Because after Christ's description, after this description of Christ dying on the cross, Isaiah describes the inclusion that's going to happen in the kingdom of God. In Christ's coming kingdom. So Isaiah 56 verse 3 says this. And I gotta think, either the Ethiopian eunuch had already read this, or he was about to read it and just dance for joy. Let not the foreigner who has joined himself to the Lord say, The Lord will surely separate me from his people. Nor let the eunuch say, Behold, I'm a dry tree. For thus says the Lord to the eunuch who has kept my Sabbath and chooses what pleases me and hold fast my covenant, to them I will give in my house and with my walls a memorial and a name better than that of sons and daughters, I will give them an everlasting name which will not be cut off. Think about what that would mean to a eunuch who has no offspring, will never have offspring, has no lineage, no heritage, no family. This foreigner is not excluded. This eunuch 
who has no future family will have a place in God's house, a memorial there, an everlasting name, a spiritual legacy as long as they seek to serve and please God. Apparently this eunuch had heard about baptism and having heard the good news, he wants in. Verse 36 says, and, and as they went along the road, they came to some water, and the eunuch said, look, water, what prevents me from being baptized? Now, it's a serious question, right? I mean, he's new to all this. Under the Jewish religion, he's unable to embrace the external sign of the previous covenant, which is circumcision, but there's no reason he can't be baptized. Is there? Like, he's probably, I, I think he's checking. Like, can I do this? And Philip said, if you believe With all your heart, you may. And he answered and he said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. And the Ethiopian eunuch had heard the good news, and now he is in. So he believed, and he's confessed that he believed in Jesus. This is not just a matter of acknowledging that something exists but putting your full confidence in that something. I mean, lots of people run around and say, I believe Jesus lived. I believe that there's a God in heaven. That's totally different than putting your faith in that thing, in that, in that entity. I mean, demons believe that Jesus lived, and demons believe that God exists in the heavens. But putting your confidence in something is different. It's saying, I trust you enough to obey you no matter the cost. Even if this looks stupid, I'm in. That's faith. The assurance of things hoped for. So the Ethiopian eunuch got it. He's all in. He's heard. He's believed. He is saved. Verse 38 says, And he ordered the chariot to stop, and they both went down to the water, and Philip as well as the eunuch, and he baptized him. And when they came up out of the water, the Spirit of the Lord snatched Philip away. And the eunuch no longer saw him, but went on his way rejoicing. Of course he was rejoicing. I mean, he had sought God, and God had done miracles so that he could be found. Miracles. What a miracle finding Philip out on a country road. What a miracle, not just a, a desert road, what a miracle there was water there for baptism. Did that lake exist 30 minutes before? I have no idea. But just to make sure that the Ethiopian eunuch recognizes there's miracles happening here, Philip disappears. I can I just picture the Ethiopian eunuch coming up out of the water going, I am so ex- Yeah, where'd he go? And the Ethiopian eunuch left changed. He was the religious outsider, but that day he became a part of the family of God. And he became a missionary to his nation. He sought God. God found him. And if you had asked Philip that morning, who do you think God's going to send you to to you know, minister to today? I guarantee you Philip would have never named a gender-neutral Ethiopian eunuch on his wish list. That's not who he would have envisioned at all. But do you ever wonder if we too are missing opportunities to share the love of God because... We're envisioning a certain opportunity and we're assuming that others are uninterested. Like we have just this idea in our head, like this is who I'm supposed to talk to. These are the kind of people I can reach. And God's going, no, there's so much more. So the question I want to ask you is, what opportunities are you missing? What opportunities are you missing? Is there someone God's laying on your heart that you can share your own testimony with. 
You don't have to be an expert in all kinds of Scripture. It's your story. You know it. You can share it. So again, I, I want to challenge you to share the story of your salvation with a friend this week. I don't know how you're going to bring it up, but I know God can cause it to happen. Right? So be praying for that opportunity. Be looking for that opportunity. Make the opportunity. I mean, literally, some of you have friends close enough that you could go, have I ever told you how I got saved? Right? I mean, that's not that hard to say. You know I'm a Christian. Have I ever told you how that happened? So I want to challenge you with that. You never know who God might be working on and calling to Himself. You never know who might be ready and willing to leave their old life and follow God. And we need to be careful not to assume that any lifestyle is beyond the reach and the transformational power of Jesus Christ. Here's the other side of that coin. It's also possible that you're the person who, like this Ethiopian eunuch, feels on the outside when it comes to religion. But today, you're hearing the good news that God loves you, that Jesus died for your sin, and that you could live in heaven forever with Him. And if that's the case, then, then my question for you is, is today your day of salvation? It is, has the Holy Spirit arranged this moment and been speaking to your heart through this whole thing? If you've been seeking and you want to be saved, it comes down to believing what you've heard and putting your faith in the saving work of Jesus Christ. Trusting in His grace and living your life for Him. Salvation really does, it, it, we make it complex, but at, at the core, it is very simple. Hearing and believing. And then following Jesus. It's something we need to share. It's something our world needs to hear. Lord God, I do pray just for a, a boldness that, that we would be ready, willing, and able to share what you've done in our lives. And Lord, able to, to point people to you, to your, to your love, to your grace, to your mercy, to your truth. Lord, that, that we can be those who proclaim the gospel in a generation that needs the good news so badly. And Lord, for anyone here today that, that is you know, feeling that, that tug of your Holy Spirit drawing them to you, Lord, I pray that they would respond to that, recognize it, repent of sin and, and put their faith in you. Confess you as Lord. God, thank you that you are so good, so faithful. Lord, that you always turn toward those who seek you. Lord, may we seek you and be on the lookout for those opportunities that you will give us to be a Philip in the life of someone who's seeking you. Lord God, thank you for your faithfulness and thank you for your mercy that are new each day. Lord, help us not to give up on something as critical as the Great Commission, but to be faithful. And we pray it all in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right, well, next Sunday we're going to be uh, checking out Paul, really Saul's conversion to Paul. And... Uh, Excited to share that with you and dig into that. So uh, come on back and we'll have some more testimonies of other people and how they got saved and excited to share those with you. So we'll see you again soon. God bless.